and who can we be? Who, who are the Jews and who can we become? It is a new book by Daniel Hartman. Um, Daniel Hartman is the uh, president of the Shalom Hartman Institute um, located in Jerusalem. I have a PowerPoint presentation um, to share with you today um, about the book and with, with um, uh, excerpts from the book. And um, I also have a little bit of a video clip that I'd like to show at the end of um, uh, Rabbi Dr. Hartman in conversation with Dr. Elias Sachs, who is the um, uh, director of the um, uh, Jewish Publication Society. Because, um, and I'll explain a little bit why I wanna show that video clip um, as we get to the end of tonight of, of our of our time together. So what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to go ahead and share share my screen. Um, please uh, make sure that uh, you can now um, make sure that uh, you can see. Hold John, on. I think it's a little bit out of focus. Is that? Um, yeah, the book jacket is a little bit out of focus. The book jacket is a little bit out of focus. So I'm going to start sharing for a second. Um, hold on, because I am uh, going to do something else to share it in a different way. So hold on. Second, and okay. All right, let me share again. Okay. It is better. Um. Uh. Interestingly enough, I can't see any of you when I'm sharing my screen. Um, which is sort of an interesting situation that normally doesn't happen when you share screen. I'm not sure if there's some kind of setting that, uh, oh, there we go. I got it. It was a setting that on, it was a setting on my side. Okay. Now I can see everybody. Okay, everybody. Um, so hopefully you can see, um, you can see my screen. Who are the Jews and who we can become? Um, Again, Daniel Harmon, Rabbi Dr. Daniel Harmon, is the president of the Shalom Hartman Institute, which is a traditionally leaning but pluralistic and um, and uh, uh, liberal in thought organization that has both an Israel office, the primary offices are in, in Jerusalem, and a North American office, and is dedicated to thinking deeply about Israel, Judaism, and the challenges that Israel and Judaism face today. He is also the chair, the Kaufman family chair on Jewish philosophy for the Shalom Hartman Institute. Um, and he is um, a, a podcaster as well. Um, he has a podcast called uh, For Heaven's Sake. So if you like what you read or you can listen to uh, about this book today and you want to listen to Dr. Hartman or Rabbi Hartman, in the future, if you're a podcast listener, you can um, go to his, his podcast for heaven's sake for heaven's sake. Um, who are the Jews and what we can become? Ask a very, very um, important question that Dr. Hartman has been struggling with for a, a, a while now. And the question is, what's the Jewish story? What is the Jewish story? And how can our Jewish story, this is, there are three parts to the book. The first part is, what is our story? The second part considers Zionism, and the third part considers um, the relationship between North American and um, uh, and Israel, Jewry in North America and Israel. And the first part of this book is called "What's Our Story," and it's and Dr. Hartman begins by saying that the Jewish people are the sum of their stories. To be clear. There have been no shortage of answered proposals to the question of who are the Jews and what the Jewish people fundamentally share. Various Jews and Jewish movements have been eager to self-anoint their ideologies 
as the content that all Jews must hold in common. So right, I want to want to start there by, by Dr. Hartman starts Dr. Rabbi Hartman starts off by saying that um, we are a people of stories, right? Probably our our most important story is the Tanakh, right? Is 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 the Torah is the Torah and the Tanakh. We are people of stories, and we also tell stories about ourselves in the modern sense. And we also, each of us, or many of us, or many leaders within our community, or movements within our community, try to say what all Jews have in common as a way of binding us together. And if I were to pause for a second and ask you what all Jews have in common, what might you, I'm going to stop the share, what might you say? Jews all have, share in common. What is our common story? I would say nothing. Nothing. What if you mean? take if you take all Jews, Sephardic, Ashkenazi, in Israel, and you want a link for all Jews, I'm not sure there's any single thing that links everybody together. I think there are definite, you know, stories and history, um, and um, you know. Uh, and 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 the, and the Old Testament that that is that is vital for us and critical for us. But one thing that links everyone, I'm I'm not sure there's anything honestly. Oh, that's really interesting, Ari. Well, I'm going to tell you that Dr. Hartman vehemently disagrees with you. <laughs> and, okay. And, and 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 that's okay. Um, his book is going to try to identify at least two stories, um, two types of stories that have historically bound. Um, the Jewish people together. But before we look at what those stories are, I want to clarify the question a little bit that we're asking. And that's what Dr. Hartman does too. He is not asking the question. Hopefully now you can see um, uh, you can see my screen again. Um, he is not asking the question, who is a Jew? Which is a membership policy question, meaning he's not asking the question, are you a member of the Jewish community or are you not a member of the Jewish community? And how do various groups decide who is or who is not a member of the Jewish community? Rather, he's asking a collective question. Who are the Jews? What are we as a people? And what is our goal and purpose? And um, to do this, he introduces two primary stories, which he calls one, the Genesis narrative, and he calls the second, the Exodus narrative. Now, that does not mean that the Genesis narrative only occurs in the book of Genesis, or the Exodus narrative only occurs in the book of Exodus in the Bible, but he introduces these two stories, and he defines them in these two ways. He says that the Genesis narrative defines Jewishness as a modality of being, an identity Jews affirm independent of what they do and do not believe. I feel connected to you and I feel connected to people on this screen and I feel connected to Jews all over the world, having nothing to do with what I, how I might practice Judaism or how another person might practice Judaism or how's another, or what my beliefs are or what another person's Jewish person's beliefs are. I have a natural sort of connection to the Jewish people that transcends or everything else. In other words, we might call it we're all kind of mishpacha. We're all family. And then there's the Exodus narrative. And the Exodus narrative defines Jewishness as a modality of becoming, a system of beliefs, of values, of practices that challenge and demand a Jew to become more. And the reason why he calls this the Exodus narrative is because in this, in 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 the Tanakh um, or in the Torah, um, this be, this this story starts with the book of Exodus, with the giving of the Torah to the Jewish people, which demand of the Jewish people certain practices and certain ways of being, and demand of them to act and behave in a certain way. So we have these two narratives, a Genesis narrative and an Exodus narrative. And in one sense, we're all mishpacha, we're all family, regardless of how we behave. And in the other hand, we sometimes define ourselves within the Jewish community by how we behave, both collectively and in different movements. And Dr. Hartman starts off by introducing these two narratives because it's through these two narratives that he then asks the question, 
how do we formulate, if we have these two narratives about who we are as a Jewish people, how do we formulate a modern understanding of that, of these two narratives, for the 21st century? So here is the core of the Genesis narrative. The foundational Genesis principle is that a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. That fellow Jews claim my loyalty and my responsibility, regardless of what they believe or do, means that the Jewish community will always be inhabited by a wide range of Jews who disagree about the essence of Judaism. So going back to Ari's point that there's Sephardi Jews and there's Ashkenazi Jews and there's Jews in Israel and there's Jews in Argentina and there's Jews in America and there's Jews in France, at the end of the day, there is still something, according to, 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 to Dr. Hartman, Rabbi Hartman, that connects us in ways that have nothing to do with how we actually behave or, be it, or, or operate as Jews. And the Exodus narrative Exodus Judaism does not denote a specific set of actions or beliefs. Rather, it carries the broader, more adaptive idea that to be in an Exodus covenantal relationship with God is to recognize that one is commanded and obligated, period. As distinct from Genesis consciousness, Exodus demands that a Jew does and believes something. What this something entails, however, is secondary and subject to diverse interpretation and choices, right? So I can have my Exodus narrative as a Reformed Jew and someone else can have their Exodus narrative as an ultra-Orthodox Jew and someone else can have their Exodus narrative as a conservative Jew or as a secular Jew, but each of us believes or feels commanded or obligated towards something within Jewish life that is beyond just feeling connected. And those two narratives put together or side by side are what we can use to create a narrative for a new narrative for who are the Jews and who we can become for the 21st century. And the reason why Dr. Hartman is considering this question is because he is seeing the breakdown of the Jewish community in action. And I unfortunately can say we've all seen that, that the Jewish community has become more fractured, that the Jewish community has become more um, uh, uh, often uh, discordant in the way that it talks and communicates with each other than it has ever before in the past. Now, it is true that the events of October 7th changed a little bit of that, but they actually only changed a little bit of that for a short amount of time. And already we're starting to see um, a, a, a disruption within the camaraderie that we all galvanized around, around October 7th. So we have these two narratives. And then Dr. Hartman asks the question, uh, wants to also clarify that Exodus Judaism and Genesis Judaism can come together. Being a Genesis Jew for many involves embracing of, I'm sorry, there's two ofs there, I typed it wrong, particular Jewish behaviors and culture simply as a manifestation of one's covenantal identity, a sign of one's affiliation, of loyalty to and seeing oneself as part of a people. I do, not because I am commanded, but because I am a Jew. So there are people who believe in the Genesis narrative, the, or who gravitate towards the Genesis narrative, the idea of all the Jews are connected as a mishpacha, as a family, and they still do things that look very Exodus narrative-like like a Passover Seder. Mm -hmm. But they might not do it because they're, they feel commanded to do a Passover Seder. They may do it because they feel a sense of camaraderie or kinship with Jews from all over the world who are also celebrating Passover or celebrating a Passover Seder. I'm going to pause my screen for a second just to see if there's any thoughts or questions. Most people are not on screen, so it's hard for me to um, uh, know what you're thinking or feeling or see your response. But if you're willing to come on screen, um, it certainly would help me to better understand um, uh, what people think. Yes, Marcy. Um, I keep, every time you're talking about this, all I keep thinking of is the term lanceman, because we were all brought up with that, you know, he's a lanceman. Whether he's like me, different from me, it didn't matter. He was a lanceman. Okay, very good. Very good. And... 
Gail, you're sharing your screen somehow. I'm not sure why. Stop sharing. Stop sharing your screen, Gail. Gail, can you hit uh, stop share screen so I can share my screen? On Zoom. Great. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much. Okay. No problem. All right. So the idea of Lanzmann. Okay. We can, we can, we can follow that. Um, we can follow that thinking as well. There was a moment in time, or moments in time, a period in time, in the 19th century, when the dance between the Genesis narrative and the Exodus narrative fell into conflict. And um, Dr. Hartman talks about this as the, as the period of, um, of emancipation. By the end of the 19th century, for possibly the first time in Jewish history, the 2000 year dance between Genesis and Exodus seemed in jeopardy in many mainstream Ashkenazi Jewish communities in Western Europe and North America. Instead of the Genesis covenant defining Jewishness as, ex as an expression of simply who you are, a member of a community bound together by a story of shared ethnic, ethnic roots, Jewish identity was grounded exclusively in the Exodus covenant, a system of beliefs, practices, and now denominational affiliation. In other words, what he's suggesting is that denominations, while we all belong to them today, actually broke down some of the fabric of what connected us all together as Lanzmann or as Mishpacha, as family, or as Jews. It created divisions between us in ways that hurt us and that ways that we need to consider repairing in a, in a, modern, in a modern time. And one of the things that came about after emancipation, and by the way, emancipation I'm talking about in Europe in the 19th century at the point where Jews are becoming, and I'll go back one, one step, at the point where Jews are becoming citizens of the countries in Europe where they live, right? There's this famous moment in the French Jewish history where the French Jews are asked, are you French or are you Jewish? And the French Jews say, we're French, and we do some Jewish things called religion that are that are religious and that sort of takes us out of the sense of being connected all as one family potentially because the french jews are now french and the german jews are now german and the north american jews are now north american or U U u.s jews united states jews and that sense of family starts to dissipate and we become more a function of how we practice judaism than how we feel about as being a collective family but something changes that and the thing that helps to change that is Zionism. Zionism helps to bring the Genesis narrative, the idea that we're all one family collectively back into the center of Jewish identity alongside a reimagined discourse around the Exodus covenant. It hopes to solve the problem of the Jewish collective existence so that Jews could reach new heights of reimagining the content of Exodus Zionism. I'm going to explain what he means in a moment. But a large segment of Israeli society has postponed this synthesis to a tomorrow that has yet to arrive. So Dr. Hartman, is, Rabbi Hartman here is saying, what, the, the picture on the, on the screen is that of Theodore Herzl, right? And Theodore Herzl said, we are a nation. We are a people, right? We are a family. We should have a Genesis relationship and we can have that Genesis relationship in Israel, in a homeland of our own. And if we have a Genesis relationship, a Genesis story in a homeland of our own, then we can also have a new Exodus relationship, a new Exodus story. Israel can serve as a place for refashioning, rethinking what Jewish life might look like, what we believe in, what we care about, what we subscribe to our Jewish behaviors, which is part of our Exodus story. 
And part of the challenge that Dr. Hartman suggests is that a lot of Israeli, a lot are Israeli, our Israeli community or Israeli Jewry has not really yet tried to bring together that synthesis of Jewish peoplehood, nor has that happened in North America. And hence, we have a real tension in our Jewish community today. North American Judaism began as exorcist-centered Judaism and has shifted slowly towards a balance between Exodus and Genesis-centered Judaism for a few reasons, one of which is the Holocaust, Dr. Hartman suggests. Right? The Holocaust galvanized us in a way of family that had not been true in North American Jewry and has also had galvanized in Israel a little bit. And in addition, this image here, this second image is the image of, can you recognize what it is? I don't know what it is. Which one? It's the one of the soldiers. It's the, in, in the camp. It's the 67 war when they first get to the wall. Correct. So one is a picture from the Holocaust, and the second is a picture of the 67 wall when they get to the Western Wall and they liberate Jerusalem um, in 1967. And those two moments helped to galvanize the Jewish community in ways that were more Genesis-like than Exodus-like. If you remember 1967, I was born in 73, so I do not remember 1967. But if you remember 1967, the history suggests that Jews galvanized together as a, with a strong sense of peoplehood because of the liberation of Jerusalem um, in ways that had not happened prior to 1967. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the history of the reform movement, it was only post-1967 that reform Judaism really embraced Zionism as a feature prior to 1967. If you take a look at some of the platforms of the reform movement, and I'm not trying to call out the reform movement directly, I'm just making, I'm using it as an example. There was more of a sense of we are North, we are North American Jews. Our family is North American Jewish family. We are not a collective. We identify by how we behave. We're Americans who identify by how we behave. So first, the first part of this book is identifying these two narratives, this mishpacha or landsman narrative and this exodus narrative. And then Rabbi Hartman says, what are we going to do with this? How can we use these two narratives to build for ourselves a better Jewish community? And part two of the book is where he suggests a, a new form of Zionism for the 21st century. He says the following. Based on the broadly liberal sensibility shared by the vast majority of contemporary Jews in North America, and at least 60% of Israeli Jews who vote for liberal parties or coalesce around judicial reform, if you remember judicial reform were the demonstrations of last summer, I will now outline a new paradigm for how a revitalized synthesis of Genesis and Exodus can spark critical insights and transformative solutions in some key areas of communal dysfunction playing out between Israel and North America in the 21st century. And he goes on to say, some of the, he elaborates on some of the central challenges facing Israel today, overcoming the original sin of religion and state, convincing secular Israelis to embrace their Exodus Judaism, meaning embrace the way that they behave and think about Judaism as a system of belief, not just as a, as a country they live in. Rising above Israel's deeply entrenched rejection of the value of Jewish life outside its borders, meaning there, is this, there has been historically this sense that Israel is the center of Jewish life and everybody else is on the periphery. And that needs to change in Israel in order for us to all be one family and the othering of Israeli-Palestinians, re-embracing pursuit of peace in political discourse, and challenging Israeli society to return to its core liberal, Jewish, and democratic values. <clears throat> and he suggests in his book that by using these stories, 
these two narratives, we can help to repair and rebuild Zionism for the 21st century. Now, this was a long text, and so I didn't, um, I didn't uh, uh, type it all out. But I'd like to read for you for a moment from his book, page 139, what Zionism would look like in the 21st century if you had a synthesis of the Genesis and the Exodus narrative in Jewish life. He outlines nine ideas, and I'm going to just kind of go through them, summarize them quickly. One, this new Zionism would encourage a synthesis between our 3,000-year tradition and modernity. Modernity's teaching as a, and contemporary expressions of Jewish teaching. It cultivates human autonomy and the right to decide what's best for oneself. It views religious tradition, which is the Exodus narrative, okay, with no single position being the most important. It adopts pluralism and tolerance as the default tools for navigating Jewish and ideological difference. It establishes boundaries and limits to pluralism and tolerance, okay, and decides what those boundaries are, but allows for the full spectrum of Jewish expression. It embraces the multifaceted nature of Judaism as a system of balancing ethics, faith, ritual, and learning. It calls for religiously and ideologically diverse public sphere in which the state makes no law respecting the establishment or preference of one religion or denomination over the other. This is particularly problematic in Israel, where Orthodox Judaism leads the way Judaism operates in Israel, right? It stands for human rights and a Judaism dedicated to the inalienable freedoms of all human beings. And it demands that all others, meaning be treated as we Jews have wanted to be treated in history. What is hateful unto you, do not do unto others. The cornerstone of Jewish ethics applies to all humankind. And here Rabbi Hartman is, is, is connecting this directly to the way that we treat um, the Arab is the Israeli Arab society as well as the Palestinians. I'm going to stop the share for a second. See if there's any questions or thoughts. Again, since there aren't that many people on the screen, it's a little hard to know what people are thinking. Well, uh, what you're what what you're clearly recounting here, uh, Jonathan, and uh, I'm, I'm finding myself. Uh, really thinking through uh, what's being presented. And uh, uh, so it seems to me that certainly, uh, having been bef born before 1967, <laughs> that uh, uh, some of the thoughts that are being presented here, particularly with the establishment of the State of Israel, uh, has been a very somewhat unifying uh, result in terms of the way Jews might identify or feel. So it has been unifying at moments, but what Doc, thank you, Peter, but what Dr. Rabbi Hartman is suggesting is that that unity has fallen away. Do you know that the majority, the vast majority of millennial Jews today see no value in a relationship with the state of Israel? The vast majority of Gen Z Jews today, which are Jews, the generation after millennial, and Gen Alpha Jews, which are teenagers or tweens now, feel far less connected to the Jewish community, far less connected to Israel than previous generations did. And, and far less connected to other Jews than previous generations. So Dr. Hartman is seeing these two narratives as an opportunity to sort of rebuild both Jewish life within North America, but also rebuild Jewish life within Israel, and then also rebuild Jewish life between North America and Israel, the relationship between the two. So in his first, in the, so first he outlines in this book, he outlines his two stories, Genesis Nexus, 
Then he outlines what, a, what, what Zionism might look like, a, a, a renewed Zionism for the 21st century. And then he outlines what the future of diaspora Judaism, particularly North American diaspora Judaism, would look like in the 21st century. And he suggests the following in part three called A Diaspora Future. The war. He recognizes that the relationship between North America and Israel, the, 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 there is an eroding relationship between North American Jewry and Israeli Jewry. And he suggests that um, begin, we should start just thinking about this by beginning by analyzing the unique shift from the Jewish experience of otherness to one of at-homeness in North America and its profound consequences, right? That intermarriage as a new normal in diaspora Jewry's eroding relationship with Israel is one um, feature, a high rate of intermarriage within North American Jewry, particularly North American Jewry, is a high rate of, is a, high, is a, is a feature which, continue, which, which, which tends to separate us um, uh, and disconnect us from from our from our from from Israel and by the way from other diasporas, other Jewish diasporas that are not North American. He talks about the fact that he has two national identities, Israeli and American. Dr. Hartman was actually born in Canada. If Israeli and North American Jewry were to disengage from each other, my principal concern would not be about Israel's political well-being, but whether my Jewish story is in danger of coming to an end, a Genesis emergency. I have no Judaism without my people. And he suggests also in this eroding relationship, for too long the pro-Israel community counted on the Genesis family model as a safety net, mitigating the gap between the Israel and that liberal American Jews envision and the Israel that is. But that safety net has become threadbare, no longer able to support the weight of North American Jewry's estrangement. Genesis-inspired whitewashing of Israel's failures will no longer be tolerated by North American Jews. And if you have, you know, there are, there are strong movements now within the Jewish community, particularly after what happened in October 7th, but even before that are very disconnected, disassociated from Israel, feel that Israel no longer represents what, who they are and a connection that they can have to their Judaism. And that relationship that had been strong in 1967, or that relationship that had been strong post-Holocaust, is, is dissipating. Leslie, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a comment that... Um... You know, reflecting back to, you know, a generation, a couple of generations, there um, may have been a more, well, there was more of a connection, awareness um, of, you know, the international world, you know, Israel, but Europe, I mean, many, uh, uh, you know, of our parents, grandparents, you know, came from and then and talked about their experiences. And so, and so that world, you know, was, you know, more front and center in conversation. And just today, you know, young people, you know, unless they're involved in, I don't know, going over, you know, as part of their eighth grade capstone or, uh, you know, if their families really encourage that connection with Israel, th there just isn't that platform um, for connection that there was 50, 60, 80 years ago, um, you know, where I know in my family growing up, I mean, it wasn't, you know, you, uh, you know, grandparents didn't talk about it all that much, but you were much more aware of what happened. There was some discussion of what, of what happened, you know, in Europe and then, you know, how Israel came to be, there just is much less so now, I think. Uh, okay, I think that I think I, I think that's exactly why Dr. Hartman wrote this book, right? He okay. wrote this book specifically because he is recognizing that that connection between Jews in America mm -hmm. and that connection between Jews in America, North America, and Israel is eroding, mm -hmm. and that challenge can perhaps be, be solved with um, 
with his with his new vision. Yes, Ari. Um, so reading reading what you've presented and, and talked about um, makes me think my original comment or answer to your question that saying that there's nothing in common with, you know, if you take all Jews in the world, um, I, I don't think Rabbi Dr. Hartman would, would like to agree with that, but I'm not sure that he would vehemently disagree. I think from what, you're, what you've presented, he aspires to, you know, have much more connection than there is today and perhaps more connection like there was in the past. But, you know, looking at the atomized world today, he may, you know, see echoes at least of, you know, no commonality between um, Jews the world over. Okay, great. That, it's a great segue into actually into my next slide because I want it, my, 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 my next slide is actually, thank you, Ari. My next slide is actually what he suggests is the solution. Oh. Mm. And he says, shares the following. He says, how do we stop Jewish particularism? How do we stop the idea of us only being Jews in the little corner for ourselves? How do we recreate the idea of being part of a Genesis narrative, of all being one family, one mishpacha, landsman, of all having connections and ties that bind us in an Exodus narrative of shared commitment? How do we do that? He says the following. In my view, the solution is not to be found in eliminating all particular loyalties, as advocated by utilitarian universalists who posit that the most effective way to improve the world is to disconnect moral responsibility from all external ties, familial, communal, national, and all resources solely on the basis of need. Rather, an attempt to the cancellation of particular identities and loyalties, we can come, we we can embrace complex identities. When we adopt instead a multiplication of spheres of identity and its corollary flowing from multiple loyalty claims of multiple communities claiming each and every one of us, the dangers of toxic particularism naturally dissipate. In other words, this is not an easy quote, right? In other words, when I choose to see myself as having more than one identity and more than one Jewish identity and not having those in conflict with each other, right? When I see myself as being able to be connected, right? Have multiple claims on my Jewish loyalties, multiple claims from multiple Jewish communities, as opposed to saying, this is who I am as a Jew and everything else is not who I am as a Jew, right? then we have the ability to transcend Jewish particularism and have a stronger connection and bond to one another. And it seems like a simple idea, but it's really not. Now, I'm not here to teach Dr. Hartman's thinking. I'm here as a book reviewer, meaning I'm sharing with you, I encourage you to go and read the book, right? to more deeply understand the philosophy that he is considering. And I highly recommend you do that. But this is a little taste of what it is that he um, is hoping to, uh, to suggest to us as a, to, to build a stronger Jewish community. Now, here's the challenge. The challenge is, is that this book was finished um, and published before October 7th. And so it felt a little strange to me to not share something, I'm gonna stop the shift for a second, not share something about Dr. Hartman's thoughts on this issue post October 7th. Because October 7th was a game changer for the Jewish community in so many ways. And it would be irresponsible to um, to not think that Dr. Hartman has been thinking about what does October 7th mean in, in light of um, building a stronger, more cohesive Jewish community with the Genesis narrative and the Exodus narrative. And so what I would actually like to do is I'd like to share a bit of video from Dr. Hartman's first book talk 
following the publication of this book after October 7th. We'll also give you a little bit of an opportunity to see and hear Dr. Rabbi Dr. Hartman um, for himself mm -hmm. and get a little sense of, of, of his own words in how he's thinking about this. I need to share my screen a special way to do this, so just give me a moment. Okay. And I need to, can everyone see the, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can um, see the video now. Okay. And I need to scroll a little bit in the video in order to get to the place we want to go. So just give me a moment. Is, is, is what's going to determine. And here we go. We're going to go to here. We'll start here. And then um, on, the, on the left, you're going to see Dr. Elias. Elias Sack, who is the, um, uh, the president of the Jewish Publication Society. And on the right, you will see Dr. Hartman, who is our author and speaker. Covenant is removed. You're missing the essence of the Jewish story. So that's whether it's religious pluralism, whether it's the way you see yourself, or when you come to Israel and what you yearn for and how we think about some of these difficult questions, it comes down to how do we balance Genesis and Exodus in our political, spiritual, moral lives? So you've now alluded a few times to the war in Gaza. For those watching this, we're recording this conversation on, on December 21st, 2023. Um, and of course, the, the book itself that thinks through this framework of Genesis Judaism and Exodus Judaism um, was written um, long before the events of October 7th. Um, and you know, you've already begun to think about it, but I, I'd love to hear more about kind of what's it like revisiting the book in light of that horrific day? You know, are there ways you've already alluded to this? Are there ways in which the book kind of helps you think about developments of the past two and a half months? And you know, maybe conversely, are there ways that you would have written the book differently today i'm always worried about this question not just about my book but it's about everything that i do as a teacher and the difference between being a prophet and a teacher is the prophet has a truth which they declare from the mountain and whatever reality is about just doesn't impact them they have their truth and their truth doesn't change but that's why by the way at least according again to our to, to, the, to the Torah, to the Tanakh, prophets were a total failure in their generation. They didn't convince anybody. Nobody changes their mind by the prophets. There's only one case where people were convinced by what a prophet said, and that's Jonah. And it just so happens he was prophesizing to non-Jews. There's no case of Jews hearing this prophetic word. And I'm, I'm petrified of something that I worked on for so long and tested on tens of thousands of people that I'll become more committed to that. I'll become a prophet. You know, you write your book. I have my book, you know, but um, so I'm very worried about that. And in everything that we're doing here at the Hartman Institute, I've told everybody, any curriculum that was written before October 7th has to be changed. Nobody could implement a pre-October 7th curriculum in anything that we do. Because an educator doesn't start with their truth. It starts with where people are. Now, again, so I'm very suspicious in general. Now, but if I was right, I think I, I think, I don't know, I use the word right, but I might have had an insight into a core part of who we are. These categories should survive October 7th. And as I was just talking, they do. I do believe that they do. And when I think about the war in Gaza, when I think about the Palestinian conflict and resolving it afterwards, when I think about some of the major challenges facing Jewish life, they're still there. And so if I was right that this does reflect a certain core sense of Jewishness for 3,000 years, it would be surprising if it would become irrelevant. But I say that with a grain of salt because everybody has to be frightened of being too prophetic and being too in love with their book. <laughs> because it's not about the book. It's about how do we create a Jewish life of meaning? So I'm hoping that it still does. I know for me, um, 
you know, this is the first time I'm talking about the book since the word the world the war started. So I'm I'm reengaging with it again, and I'm and I'm I have to test myself, and some skepticism is is worthwhile. That said, there are things that I know I got wrong, and one of them is I was an anti-Semitism poo pooer my whole life. Now, I'm still an anti-Semitism poo-pooer in some sense, in the sense that I don't think Jewish identity could be built on anti-Semitism. I don't. I don't think it's going to create the type of Jewish people we want. And I think Jews today who have to choose to be Jewish, and everybody is a Jew by choice, today Jews have an exit that we never had before. And if you have an exit... And if you have a non-Jewish spouse who is living a Jewish life, but also has, a, has another identity, why stay? And I think, so in general, I, whenever I saw anti-Semitism, I belittled it. And I belittled it both as a, both, I belittled it empirically because I think there were grounds to do so. But the truth is, don't tell anybody. I really, I belittled it because it had no part in building a Judaism of meaning. And if I would write this book again, I would have to talk about anti-Semitism because you can't poo-poo it right now. Fear is not just part of the Israeli reality. It's also part of North American Jews reality. And we need to give an accounting for anti-Semitism. Does anti-Semitism create a stronger Genesis Jewish consciousness? Is it something different? The, the intersection of Jewish identity and anti-Semitism has no place in this book. And I need to develop it. And I can't answer now how I would do so because I'm now, I have a research team, which I'm a part of, whose job it is to ask ourselves this question because I have no Torah of anti-Semitism. I don't have. Okay. I hope you found that interesting. Very. Fascinating, uh, Jonathan, to, to actually see the author and hear his words and feel what he has to say. It was breathtaking. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Um, I, I, I hope. Yes. He is a remarkable, thoughtful speaker, and I wanted you to have a little sense of an opportunity to hear him and, 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 and hear his speech and the way he talks. But I also wanted you to have the opportunity to hear a little bit about what he's been thinking about since October 7th, because when I picked up this book for the first time, we picked it up before October 7th. And when I was reading this book for the Jewish Book Council, October 7th happened. And when we got to certain places in this book, I couldn't help but ask myself, how, how, is, how does what he says change? So on one level, he says it doesn't change. The fundamental challenges of Jewish people and how do we connect to each other and what is our role in the world all stay the same. But what does change, or what we need to at least pay more attention to now, is the reality of anti-Semitism and the reality of how anti-Semitism has could be a, a galvanizing force, unfortunately, again, as it had been in the past, or it could actually be a force that could push people out of Judaism, people with multiple identities. I don't know if you caught what he was saying about people who are in, have multiple identities who say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to be part of this anymore. I, this is just too much, right? I don't want to be hated. So it's a very, very interesting and challenging new space that uh, Dr. Hartman needs to investigate now with the Hartman Institute as he thinks about who are the Jews and who we become. Um, I want to just end by saying that um, the reason why I think this book is so valuable to read. 7.55 p.m. It is 7.55 p.m. The reason why this book is so valuable to read is because it asks each of us 
to think a little bit more deeply about how do we connect to our Judaism, Genesis or Exodus or both? How will our relationship with Israel be different now that Israel is a very different place post the judicial reforms and now post October 7th? And how will North American Judaism be a more cohesive Judaism with more of a greater mission and a story to tell about who we are as a people? Not who is a Jew, but who are the Jews? I want to go back to that as our original question. He's not asking who's in and, he, and who's out. He's asking, who are we as a people? What can we become as a people? How can we be our best selves as a community? And can we look at the Genesis narrative and the Exodus narrative as two possibilities of thinking about this? And that is Dr. Hartman, Rabbi da Daniel Hartman's book. If you ever have a chance to pick it up, I highly recommend it. Also can check out his podcast. You can also check out um, uh, uh, one of his, he, he also is the author of a few other books called um, Putting God Second, How to Save Religion from Itself and the Boundaries of Judaism. As you can see, he is a person who wants to challenge, as the Shalom Hartman Institute does, challenge the way we think about what Judaism should look like and feel like in a liberal 21st century world. And so thank you. Thank well, you. Thank uh, you, everybody, for the opportunity to share with you a little bit about this book, and hopefully you'll pick it up. Well, the thank you goes to you, Jonathan, and thank you so much for exposing us to the book. And uh, obviously, Daniel Hartman is a voice that's good to hear. And I struck, was struck today by interviews that Jewish children in school today are being challenged to their Judaism and how they're reacting to it. Uh, you got to just listen to the news that's going on right today. It is, uh, it is, it is heartbreaking to see the anti-Semitism that's going on in the schools and that these Jewish kids being interviewed on television are responding. It, it, it's at another level. And of course, in college, we certainly know the kind of anti-Semitism that's been going on there. But listen, Jonathan, I, Again, I but I do want to end on a positive note, Peter. I, 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 he talked about anti-Semitism at the end of October 7th, but his book is, is far beyond that. Right. And his book gives you a possibility to think about what Judaism could be in the 21st century out of our particularistic way of thinking about being Jewish. Yeah. So, yes, anti-Semitism is a challenge. Yes, it is a significant challenge. Um, but it is... Um, but this is also an opportunity to think about the bigger questions that Judaism, the perennial questions right. um, that Judaism offers us and the perennial mission of what the Jewish people should be. And he doesn't consider intermarriage as much of a problem. He recognizes that intermarriage is a reality of North American Jewry and encourages us to begin to understand that as a feature. It is not going away. And it has got to be a, 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 um, a recognizing that and identifying that. And, and you don't necessarily have to practice it yourself, but understanding that it is a feature, a reality of North American Jewry helps to actually bridge a gap between Israeli Jewry and North American diaspora. Thank you, Jonathan. And Thank you, everybody. Uh, you got a lot of thanks coming from the folks who we're here today. No, no Take problem. Care. It was my pleasure. And I hope I encourage you to read the book. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, uh, okay, very Thanks good. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you, everybody, Thank you. for attending. Take, Bye. Take care. Bye.